Condition for being a hero. If a man wants to become a hero, the snake must first become a dragon. Otherwise, he is lacking his proper enemy. Our age has been called many things, but an age of cowards may best describe it, given the immense fear, anxiety, and helplessness that most people display in the face of even trivial threats. We are not a generation that moves forward into the uncertain future in a bold and heroic manner. Instead, most people fear the future and prefer safety, comfort, and ease of life to risk-taking experimentation and freedom. Or as the 21st century sociologist Frank Furity writes, Young people are socialized to feel fragile and overawed by uncertainty, and as a result, the defining feature of the current Western 21st century version of personhood is its vulnerability. Although society still upholds the ideal of self-determination and autonomy, the values associated with them are increasingly overridden by a message that stresses the quality of human weakness. And if vulnerability is, indeed, the defining feature of the human condition, it follows that being fearful is the normal state. Overawed by uncertainty, fearing the future, conceptualizing oneself as vulnerable, weak, and fragile, is not a recipe for individual or social flourishing. Rather, this way of life promotes mental illness and paves the way for authoritarian rule. And so, as we will explore in this video, the world would benefit if more people were willing to live just a little more dangerously. For danger, when a byproduct of pursuing worthwhile goals or in defense of values like freedom, justice, or peace, is life-promoting, and as the Roman historian Tacitus put it, the desire for safety stands against every great and noble enterprise. Not all societies, however, have ranked safety as high on the scale of values as does the modern West. Many flourishing societies of the past considered safety to be a secondary value and showed a remarkable capacity to take risks in the face of an uncertain future and to display courage and bravery in the presence of danger. Historically, some of the most prosperous societies, ancient Athens, Renaissance Italy, 19th century Britain, were among those that were most oriented towards experimentation and the taking of risks. In taking the opposite approach and in showing a strong preference for safety over risk-taking, the unfolding of the human potential is not actualized but stunted. For to develop on an individual level and to advance as a species, exploration of the unknown and experimentation with novel ways of interacting with the world is a necessity, and this entails taking risks and confronting danger. But such is a price that must be paid, as the alternative is to stagnate in the confines of an ever-shrinking comfort zone, to regress in body and mind, and to fall victim to anxiety disorders, depression, or other diseases of despair. A further flaw with an approach to the future that strongly favors the safe road is that it creates fertile ground for tyrannical or even totalitarian rule. For as Alexander Hamilton famously stated, to be more safe, they, at length, become willing to run the risk of being less free. When a society elevates safety to the position of a first-order value, freedom is by necessity demoted to the position of a second-order value, which can be trampled on by those in power who, throughout history, have disguised tyrannical intentions with claims of wanting to make a society safer. What makes matters worse is if a society socializes people to be fearful of the future and overawed by uncertainty, the masses will welcome or openly call for authority figures to protect them, or as Furity notes, relieving people of the burden of freedom in order to make them feel safe is a recurring theme in the history of authoritarianism. Given that a society which deifies safety is also a society ripe for tyranny, it is up to those who favor freedom to take a more heroic approach to life. For when the menacing clouds of authoritarian rule darken the horizon, unless more people are willing to take risks and face danger in the service of values such as freedom, justice, peace, and social cooperation, the grip of tyrants will only solidify, or as John Stuart Mill put it, a man who has nothing which he is willing to fight for nothing which he cares more about than he does about his personal safety, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free, unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. 
As role models for the task of living more heroically, we can look to the ancient Greeks, a civilization that rightly held safety to be a secondary, not primary value, and which saw risk-taking and facing danger as morally commendable. Danger, wrote Albert Camus, makes men classical, and all greatness, after all, is rooted in risk. Friedrich Nietzsche was also a proponent of this classical approach to life, and he praised Pericles, the Athenian leader who in his famous funeral speech celebrated the Athenians' indifference and contempt for safety, body, and life. Contrast this to the modern world, where, to paraphrase the author Christopher Cocker, we tend to deprive the bold risk-takers who spur safety of the fullness of their lives in order to support the smallness of our own. Fortunately, we don't need to wait around for politicians to pass legislation to approve of a bolder approach to life. We just need to live in this manner. We need to look at the uncertain future not merely as a source of threats, but also of hope and opportunity, and we need to see risk-taking as justified when in defense of cherished values or in the pursuit of worthwhile goals. By demoting safety to its rightful place as a secondary value, we will cease living as a helpless pawn who must be coddled from youth to old age by an authority figure, and we will regain the ability to shape the course of our life. We will mature psychologically and become better equipped to cope with whatever the future brings, for as Nietzsche explains, Danger alone acquaints us with our own resources, our virtues, our armor and weapons, our spirit, and forces us to be strong. First principle, one must need to be strong, otherwise one will never become strong. While taking greater risks and flirting with danger can shorten one's life, it is helpful to remember that a long life is not necessarily a good life. A safe life, lacking real challenges and absent in adventure, is inert and leads to a withering away of body and mind into staleness, repetition, boredom, and stagnation. Such is not living, it is mere existing, or as the Roman Stoic Seneca put it. There is no reason for you to think that any man has lived long because he has gray hairs or wrinkles. He has not lived long, he has existed long. In addition to helping one live more fully, a courageous willingness to take risks and to flirt with the danger can turn us into a great benefactor of mankind. For so long as the values that guide us and the goals we pursue are noble and life-promoting, courage reveals a caring attitude for the well-being of others. For unlike the coward who is concerned primarily for his or her own safety, and who demands everyone else conform to his or her neurotic ways, the hero is willing to risk life and limb in the service of values that move society forward, or as Alistair MacIntyre wrote in After Virtue, A Study in Moral Theory. If someone says that he cares for some individual, community, or cause, but is unwilling to risk harm or danger on his, her, or its behalf, he puts into question the genuineness of his care and concern. Courage, the capacity to risk harm or danger to oneself, has its role in human life because of this connection with care and concern. If, therefore, we desire a fulfilling life, care for our mental health and care for the future of our society, we need to act with courage and not worship at the altar of safety. We need to take risks in the service of life-promoting values and not adhere to the view that a good life is a safe life. For believe me, wrote Nietzsche, the secret for harvesting from existence the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slopes of Vesuvius. Send your ships into unchartered seas. Soon the age will be past when you could be content to live hidden in forests like shy deer. What is our common bond truly? Freedom! Freedom! Without freedom, you can't be a Christian no matter what denomination you belong to. You can't be a Buddhist. You can't own a donut shop. You can't drive from here to Oregon. You can't be an American because that's what it's all about, and that's the only thing that it's all about. Nothing else. Nothing else. It's about freedom. Only freedom.
it means you have to let other people be free, even if they disagree with you. I had a tremendous admiration for the courage of those two communists who had the guts to walk up with their little communist sign and their communist flag, two of them, young people, all alone, in that sea of America, militia, uniformed patriots. And I saw people who wanted to kill them. You know, I don't like their philosophy. They're misled, misguided. Communism is a terrible thing. But they had guts. And I had a great respect for them. And I believe in freedom. Which means there is no way in the world that we could have had that meeting on your state house grounds this morning unless they had the right to do what they did. Then you had better understand that. Because if you stop them from having their freedom to make their political statement, you have stopped yourself. You have stopped everyone. And that must never happen in this country. It must never happen in this country. Because if it does, there'll never be another congregation like this, and you'll never hear me speak again, because I'll be dead. And so will most of you. This country is about freedom. Because only with freedom can you have all of the other things that everybody professes that they want. It's the only way it can be done. I hear all kinds of misconceptions and misstatements. I have the freedom of the press. No, you don't. No, you don't. The man who owns the press has the freedom of the press. And he can say in his press whatever he wants, but you can't. That's why I get angry with Americans when they say, the Jews control the press. Who sold it to them? How'd they get it? You want the press? Start a press. You want to be on the radio? Do it. But stop whining. Stop bitching. Stop complaining. That guy that owns the press, that's his press. He can do with it what he wants. Just like you do with your car what you want because it's your property. He doesn't owe you anything unless you've got a contract with his signature on it that says he will print what you say. And if you can't produce that, he doesn't owe you anything. That's America.